My brothers and sisters and friends, it is a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. We had hoped for much larger attendance. However, we feel that many of our good brothers are heading for the hills. I hope they have good luck and do not get shot. Uh, we have prepared this program tonight not with the thought of entertainment in mind. We have felt that it is thoughts that are perhaps necessary to be effective in our everyday lives. And I hope, uh, I did make a thought to mention several times that Maybe Brother Skousen will inspire us enough tonight that we may not even be able to sleep when we get home if this thing affects us and we uh, learn what is going on in our country. We will commence our program this evening by having Brother Wayne Neely, one of our Boy Scouts, lead us in the Star Spangled Banner, or lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, I should say, and Sister Janet Tattersall will later lead us in the Star Spangled Banner. Brother Yost Madrian will conduct at the organ. After these ceremonies, we will ask Brother Charlie Baggett, a member of our bishopric, to offer the opening prayer. Will the audience please rise? Place your right hand over your heart. Pledge of Allegiance, repeat. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Will you please remain standing?
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy precious name. We humbly bow our heads this evening, Father, here in this chapel, which has been dedicated for the purpose of uh, teaching truth and righteousness unto the, thy children that live here upon the face of this earth. And we know, Father, that thou hast said that this great land of America upon which we live shall never be taken from this people are given to another people uh, if we are humble and faithful and serve thee and keep thy commandments. But, Father, the adversary is working rapidly upon the face of the whole earth at this time. We realize these things, and we are thankful that thou hast raised up such a man with the knowledge and understanding of these things as Brother Cleon Skousen. We feel grateful to thee this night for having the privilege of uh, having him here in our ward to speak to us upon the principles that exist here in our nation at this day and time and to warn us of the things that might befall us if we are not true and faithful in keeping thy commandments. 
And we ask thee to bless and inspire his mind tonight, that he might arouse us to these conditions, that we might be more mindful of this wonderful country in which we live and the things that are taking place, that we might pledge our allegiance to thee, Father in heaven, and serve thee with all our heart, might, mind, soul, and strength. We now dedicate this meeting into thy care and keeping, and pray that as we leave this chapel tonight, that we will love this great nation of ours more than ever before and that we'll have a greater determination to do our part in making it a better place in which to live and that the powers of the priesthood that we hold, we will use them in overcoming evil. These things we ask in the name of thy worthy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I observed from the stand here that while we, were, while we were singing our national anthem, I believe we all are under indictment. Uh, those of you in the audience who were singing were buried in the books, and those of us here on the stand that didn't use books found we did not know the song very well. So I believe if we are going to renew our efforts to bring back the glory in our flag and perhaps some of the pride in our great country, I believe we should all first learn our national anthem. Uh, that may be the answer to what is wrong in our country. I believe another thought, to not to criticize those who are present here tonight, because this just makes manifest uh, how many people are interested in learning about the things that are going on in our country, and I believe this perhaps emanates right from our national leaders, a lack of concern for what some people might call small issues, but those small issues in many respects are placing our jeopardy in freedom. I hope that we will dedicate ourselves to uh, righting the wrongs that we might hear tonight in this talk, and that we might pass these things on and that we might try to better our lives and, above all, to better our country, because that is the Christian thing to do. As I stood at the door with Brother Skousen, many of you walked in and said that you heard him on television. I'm sure that you are aware of many of the fine points he made, and I would like to go on record as saying that I am 100% behind the five proposals that he made. I feel that they are necessary and they're perhaps overdue. But I feel that the way these things can be injected into our government and our course of action in combating this communist menace, perhaps we should make our desires known. I'm not going into those points at this time. I believe perhaps Brother Skousen will do it. We're very happy to have him here with us tonight. I will not multiply words because I want to give him as much time as he feels fit to take we know he is a busy man. Last night he was speaking on the coast, and I understand just a few minutes ago he got off a plane. I don't know where he will speak tomorrow night, but I do hope that he can perhaps spend this weekend here in Salt Lake with his family. It's my pleasure, brothers and sisters, to turn the time over to Brother Skousen at this time to use as he sees fit. This is certainly a pleasure, my brothers and sisters, to be in my own hometown. I only get to do this about once every three weeks, and I'm also grateful for a chance to meet in these intimate circumstances where I can see all your faces. The other night on TV, all I could see were floodlights, and last night it was almost as bad. Where they have these large audiences, there seems to be a pattern now of throwing a spotlight on the speaker and uh, what he's supposed to use for eyes after the talk is over I don't know but this is the pattern we've been going through it's been rather exciting going across the country about every three or four weeks for the past year and I did this last trip took me into the Chicago area up into Montreal Canada then on down into Shreveport, Louisiana, over into Florida, back into Texas, and then down into California. Then um, I will leave Monday and go back to California, where Monday night I will speak to the Hungarian Freedom Fighters National Convention. 
They're getting ready to take their country back, and they've been kind enough to invite me to be their speaker Monday night. Tuesday I will catch the plane for New Orleans, Louisiana, where uh, there will be a whole week school in which I will participate three days, and then I will return Friday to speak in Los Angeles at um, one of the rallies that they're holding there and then come home Saturday. Then the w next week is sort of like that, except that we go in a little different direction. But all across this country now, a wonderful thing is happening. And the thing that we've been trying to do is to get our people to realize that they're important. Now this is where we've made our big mistake. We've got, gained the impression that these people back in Washington that are supposed to be representing us are going to know what we're thinking without ever having been told, and that by some magic process they're going to be able to do exactly what the people wish to have done when we aren't even paying attention to what they're doing. And we have been, we have been very neglectful. We have not been making democracy work. And as a result, this leadership has been taking us down an ambush trail that has led to one disaster after another. And we ourselves are to blame for this because some of these men did it out of ignorance. Some of, it, some of them did it out of some fantastic plan they had in mind that they didn't know anybody was objecting to. And others, I think, have just gone along with the stream tide. Now our people suddenly awaken and found not, not only one-third of the human race in slavery, but the United States is on the verge of being isolated. You see, by 1965, Africa could be gone. India, all Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines, Japan, parts of Central and South America could all be gone by 1965. And where will we be? We'll say, how in the world did this happen? Well, it, it was deliberately done. They've been working on this for 40-some-odd years, and we're just beginning to reap the whirlwind. And so we're saying to our people, don't sit there. First of all, study. Find out what you want done, and don't you let your senator and congressman be able to accuse you of not having made your will known. Now, uh, Senator Dodd told me the other night at dinner, uh, he said, uh, Cleon, don't ask him to write any more letters. He said, I've had to hire three new secretaries. He said, I don't know how I'm going to get them answered. And I said, now, Senator, I know that's a problem, but at least you know how the people feel, don't you? Well, he says, I'm beginning to get the idea. Well, that's the way it ought to be. And so don't sit silently by. You learn how to write to your senators, and it's very easy. You just simply say, uh, Senator Frank Moss. Dear Senator Moss, and then you address it to the Senate Office Building, Washington, D.C. Dear Senator Bennett, Senate Office Building, Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, Congressman David King, who happens to be your representative. Uh, dear Dave, if you know him that well, or dear Congressman King, there are some things that we'd like to see you concentrate on now. And this is the way that we'll get it done. Now, the other night... Um, uh, we had what was literally a breakthrough. This is the very first time that the message that we've been giving actually for many, many years has had this kind of an audience. And it blanketed the Western states. There were about 9 million listening on television or watching on television and 15,000 in the, Holly in the uh, Hollywood Bowl. And it was a great thrill to catch the spirit of those people. And those of you who heard the broadcast may have noticed while I was talking there was quite a rumbling out in the audience at one point. Did you notice that? Well, you'll be interested to know what that was. Practically every minority group in Europe was represented in those 15,000 people. And as I was giving my talk and they heard me saying the things that we were going to do, they, one of them shouted, what about Tito? And another one said over here, and what about Castro? And another one over here said, what about Hungary? And the, all these people wanted to be sure that their loved ones were not forgotten. That's what that rumbling was. And one of the, the chairmen started out to um, take over the microphone and, and restore order, and then he realized what was happening, and uh, I couldn't see any of them but one, but I knew he was on our side. He just didn't want to be left out. And so that's what that rumbling was in the background. And the motion picture stars, there were about 35 or 40 of them there, some of the finest people you'd want to meet, all gathered around afterwards, and 
Uh, they've been fighting communism in Hollywood, which is one of the strongholds of the Communist Party in the United States. And to have this wonderful uh, rally held with them participating, some of them have lost jobs because communist producers and communist directors wouldn't have them aboard. And uh, to suddenly see this thing switch and turn is just thrilling. So the word we're trying to get out to our people is, will you start becoming Americans again? Will you pay attention to what's happening? We've got a constitution to save. We've got men standing up in the Senate of the United States telling, that we're, telling us we're going to get rid of the constitution now. Happened here just recently. As one of the senators says, it's an 18th century document. And he says it doesn't fit modern circumstances. And it's time to move over to one world government. Well, we're for one world government when the millennium comes. Meanwhile, God said you must be able to defend yourselves and protect yourselves and don't become entangled with all of the problems of the rest of the world <clears throat> because I want to save as many people as I can in this great final catastrophe in which Lucifer is going to let, let go with everything he's got. And so you and I have got a job. The prophet Joseph said this day would come and the people would actually try to destroy <clears throat> the Constitution of the United States. And what are they doing it with? A knife? A gun? No. They're doing it in the battle of words in Congress. So don't just sit idly by and think you're not part of the battle. You are. And your vote is just as important as the President of the United States. And a letter from you to Senator Moss or Senator Bennett is just as important as any that I would write or the governor would write or anything else. You are important. So that's what we want to get over to our people. Think it through, study it out, don't take anybody's word for it, make sure that you feel good about what you're doing, and then strike with a heavy blow, as the prophet Joseph used to say. Don't, don't hit with a feather if you're going to strike, be sure you're right, and then hit with a blow that will have an impact. Now, it was wonderful last night, too, to show you what a community can do. I spoke in um, uh, Orange County, the Disneyland Hotel, two or three times, once this spring, once last fall, and the little community of Downey. Um, got to thinking and they said, what we ought to do is to get our whole town together. And so they've been carrying on a big advertising campaign and I went up there and, and here they had uh, uh, our speech, uh, the fact we we're going to give a speech in all the front page headlines of all the papers all around there and giving it tremendous publicity. So that place was packed last night. 5,000 people were jammed in there, and they had the parade of, um, I think it was 200 American flags being carried by the American Legion, the Boy Scouts, and the ROTC. And we did like we did tonight. We pledged allegiance, and we sang the Star Spangled Banner, just one verse. So we got cheated there last night, and you gave us the full works tonight. And, um, and then I spoke to them for about an hour, and we had the school people there, the mayor was there, the city council was there, and the visiting mayors from other towns that want to do the same thing, they were all there. So you could tell from the audience they were ready to go. And we, they want to do these things that we're talking about. Now the things that we've been suggesting that we do are the things that the communists have been afraid we would do. And the very fact we haven't done it before has given them courage. Because you see, they can be destroyed without ever worrying about the atomic bomb. Communism can be smothered. It can actually have the Iron Curtain fall in and uh, destroy the communist leaders if we would use massive peaceful pressures available to us, which we haven't. And so that's the story I've been trying to tell people, that there's something we can do. And we've sat around and our leaders have wrung their hands and said it's impossible, it can't be done. It doesn't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats. They have both wrung their hands and avoided the issues. And I don't blame them particularly because they thought that it was the popular thing to do. And politicians do, as a general rule, what's considered to be the popular thing. So what's happened? All of a sudden there's a rising tide that makes it popular to outlaw the Communist Party, to fight communism. And all of a sudden, it's just amazing who's beginning to stand up and say, well, um, I felt that way all the time, just waiting on the people. Now that the people want it, why, we're going to get it. Uh, look at Life magazine. I don't know whether you caught the significance of that, but here's Life magazine on the left-wing branch of um, interpreting public affairs for years. When Whitaker Chambers got into the sister magazine, the Time magazine, 
He had a terrible time as the senior editor of Time during World War II, uh, getting it out of control of the left-wing communist sympathizers and over in the direction where it interpreted news from an American point of view. You see, it's most important what your point of view is. For example, if I'm an atheist and um, I see a church burning down, I'll say, that's great. I hope they all burn down. On the other hand, if I am a Christian and I see a Baptist church burning down, even though I'm a Mormon, I'm sorry that that has happened. And if they're putting it out, I'll go in and carry buckets of dirt and sand and water, whatever they're using, and try to put it out with them. Your point of view is very important. Now, some people keep saying, now, you've got to be objective now. You mustn't get yourself emotionally involved in this thing. But I, I'm not at all embarrassed to say I'm emotionally involved in this thing. I have feelings about this. And when I see uh, nearly a billion human beings go down and I see us falling into one trap after another laid by the communist leaders, I find myself getting an, a reaction. I know that it's just a question of a very few years be before my children, I'm going to have to look into the faces of my children and say, I'm sorry, kiddies, but we didn't quite make it. They're coming in. And what's going to happen to you? I really don't know. I don't know whether going to be separated. Um, I know I'm on the list. So you're going to be without a parent. I hope everything works out for you. And I've got to put you in, in the hands of, of our Heavenly Father. Now that's what's going to happen to our people if they don't move. That's the plan. Now the prophecy on this is very significant because the Lord said when we reach this position, one of two things would happen. Either the people would humble themselves and say to God, our Heavenly Father, give us strength to endure. We will obey your commandments. We will be morally clean. We will worship you. We will be honest and we will fight for truth and righteousness. Or, it says, we will abhor God and we will turn away from him and we will become a degenerate people and if that happens, we will be wiped as clean of the land as was the wickedness of the Jaredites. And it says there will be none of the wickedness left and the large Gentile uh, cities of this nation will be left empty and will be inhabited by the ten tribes. On the other hand, the Lord says if we remain righteous, these, these United States of America will help us build a new Jerusalem in Jackson County. And if they don't help us, when we go back, there won't be very many of us left. We're going to get hit. The saints will not escape this. The prophecies are very clear. But those who do escape will be called to go back to Jackson County, and when they get there, there won't be even be a yellow dog to wag its tail. Now, that's the prophecy hanging over this generation. Now, just to give you an idea of why it's important to pay attention to what's going on here, $2 bills. They're both signed by the same people. The only difference is that when you turn them over, the one that was printed in January says, In God we trust, and the one that was printed in June does not. Now that's what's moving across the world. Down in California, they're having a meeting this coming week which says um, that they're not going to allow the children to pledge, the legion, pledge allegiance to the flag in school except on very special occasions, maybe once or twice a year. And the patriots are having to rise up and tell those educators that are trying to accomplish that that they don't represent the parents when they have that kind of a program. We want them to pledge allegiance every morning to remind them, as the Lord says, you have to do these things often, meet together often, and do these things often, and remind them that men have died in order to keep this flag flying in place of a hammer and sickle or a Nazi swastika or some other flag over this land. Men have died to achieve that. We want our boys and girls to get used to pledging allegiance to it and that whatever the future may bring, that as, as Brigham Young said, glory will not go down because this people is going to keep it waving. But we won't if we're indifferent and apathetic and just don't care. So out of Utah, they're expecting a lot of leadership, and I hope you'll provide it. Because as they told me here in California, uh, we're, we're glad we've got states like Utah that we know are 100% behind us. And I said to myself, I've got to get home right away quickly and <laughs> remind the folks to rally to the cause here because they're going to be watched. And so we ought to be speaking out, and our schools ought to be the epitome of 
patriotism and leadership and when we get some of these left-wingers out of Washington trying to tell our school teachers that they want to uh, want them to accept federal aid in order that they can control them etc we want our teachers as I've found most of them doing saying absolutely not we've worked out our schools in the past we'll do it in the future we'll keep control thank you now there's some people who are foolish enough to suggest and I say foolish advisedly because there is no historical basis for them to assume that they can accept federal aid without having it take control of our schools. And I've got some literature now that indicates if the federal government can get control of the schools, the United Nations then take over the federal government, uh, control of the schools, and they then indicate the hiring policies, the textbook policies, and the kind of things that will be taught. And I want to tell you that they will destroy respect for the Constitution of the United States all over the country as they now do in the meetings that they hold. And they've already sprinkled our textbook with some of this material. I had a daughter that wasn't doing very well in history, and so I asked her to bring her book home. And I got to reading it, and it was just loaded with this left-wing slant calling the Founding Fathers names and deprecating our early history and pointing out what a backward country we were and how many flaws and uh, uh, how many difficult things we yet had to overcome. We were so far behind some of the other peoples you would have thought. So I told uh, my, my daughter the book was subversive, that this was designed to deceive her, that this isn't true. As a matter of fact, this is the people that's gone forward and has the highest standard of living of any people in the, in the whole earth. And the thing about it is, and, and I've been from the top to the bottom several times. Our family lived in tents for several years. Uh, we lost uh, everything we owned, including a home that we were just about to pay for. I've seen this thing top side and bottom side. But I remember when my father was depleted of everything that he owned back in the Depression, he said to us boys, now don't get bitter. I want to tell you we've got a great thing here, but we abused it. We still haven't learned how to use it properly. And so if we emphasize the negative, we've got some things that we need to do better. But we've done already so much better than anybody else has done that for someone to come along and say that we should turn around and go backwards now is ridiculous because a worker in the United States can buy three times as much with his daily wage as a worker in any socialist country and five times as much as a worker can buy with his daily wage in a communist country. We're on the way up and we are leveling our people but leveling up. In every socialist and communist country, they level down. They level down. And uh, that's really the difference between a free, open society and a dictatorial society. Ours is leveling up, and, and I find that uh, um, people in our country uh, who live on the level of economy that I had to live as a boy are, are getting so very rare. I go through Texas and Louisiana and Alabama, which are considered to be the blighted areas, and there are not so many left. It's amazing how fast we're coming up, and people are getting more and more opportunities. So we mustn't let this system destroy itself by being criticized to death and turn back toward the kind of socialism that's been adopted elsewhere. And a wonderful example of it was what happened in England. You see, here are our cousins in England, and we've always had an affection for them. Ever since we, this is the way families are, you know, once you get separated and independent of each other, you love each other more. You see a couple of brothers raised in the same house, they fight like cats and dogs, then they get separated and finally they love each other and respect each other. This is the way we've been with our cousin England. And we've appreciated them, I think they've appreciated us. But notice what happened. After World War II, they were fearful that they couldn't go forward on a free enterprise basis, and so Churchill went out and the Labor Party went in. Now, as soon as the Labor Party got in, it, it demanded that they socialize coal, particularly coal, and there were several other industries that they wanted to take over. And this means nobody could own these mines privately. The government took over, controlled the workers. Now, here's what the Labor government says. We're going to take over the coal mines and we're going to produce coal like coal was never produced before. It's just ridiculous. Everybody ought to have plenty of coal. That's the important thing. Have lots of coal. So we're going to take the coal mines over and run them for the benefit of the people. And this we'll promise you that even though we're beginning to socialize industry, we won't do what they've had to do in other countries, which is to have compulsory labor. 
Now, our people don't know what compulsory labor is. They never heard about it. Now, here's the Labor Party promising the British people that they'll never have compulsory labor. Now, they say every other socialist country has had to have compulsory labor. But we think we're smart enough to avoid it. What happened? The next year they had the worst coal famine, and I, I guess it's the only real coal famine England ever had. And if any of you were there, you'll remember the restrictions. You couldn't get your house hotter than 65 degrees at any time, and sometimes they were shutting down in order to get coal for the schools, etc. Everybody wearing double clothes and so forth. It was a terrible year, just terrible. And so the following summer, it looked like the workers weren't going to be able to produce enough coal and there would be even a worse coal famine the next year. So what happened? Compulsory labor. As the government said, we're sorry, but we've just got to keep the coal miners working in the mines. They won't produce. Doggone it. They just won't produce. They keep leaving the mines and going over to more pleasant work. So we're going to keep them in the mines. And so in England, all of a sudden, you couldn't change jobs without permission. That's compulsory labor. Now, just as soon as that happens to you, we're in real trouble. England has known it and has been trying to work its way back. And I've, I made inquiry just tonight of someone who said that uh, they, were, they didn't think that even with the change of government, they've been able to get rid of compulsory labor even today. But I'm, I want to check that because I'm not sure. But notice what happens. When you socialize, you get compulsory labor, just like they got in Russia. Russia does it at the barrel, end of the barrel of a gun, and England found herself having to fine people or put them in prison if they wouldn't work where they were told to work. Now, that's how serious this is. And here the president at our, the present time is surrounded by people who keep telling them that this is the only hope for the United States. This is the way you do away with unemployment. This is not the method of productive labor. And so other people who are of the president's own party are trying to get in there close to him and say, these boys out of Harvard have made a mistake every time they've advised you to do anything, Mr. President. And so every one of you ought to be studying this. Because whether you know it or not, your future's at stake. And the control over your job is at stake. And this isn't a question of politics. This is a question of principle. Now, it's important that we do this internally because the communists are most anxious that we socialize if possible. And what I'm in favor of is getting the Democrats and Republicans together to combine in one massive program designed to improve our country in every way possible, but not at the expense of freedom. It never works when you try to put up a little dictator in charge of education or a little dictator in charge of coal or a little dictator in charge of steel or a little dictator in charge of electric power, do you know what we're fighting a life and death struggle right now to keep the dictatorship out of the electric power program of Utah? And some people say, well, it's these selfish interests that want to make a profit off of the electricity built by the taxpayers' dam over here. And what they don't realize is that when these people come in and get a monopoly and they're back in Washington, they'll tell you when you get a power line and whether or not it will be an improved amount of power. They make all those decisions back there. And the first thing you know, they've got so many decisions to make, they can't make them. And you have to stand in line to get them to please make a decision. Now, that's why our program, the American program, is to keep everything under control locally. And everybody's supposed to make a profit, otherwise it isn't a good system for anyone. Now, the wage earner wants to make a profit. The, the, the buyer wants to make a profit. The seller wants to make a profit. And that's what you do under free enterprise under proper circumstances. So watch this situation closely. Um, people will divide up in various ways and various parties and say, this is the way we feel about it, this is the way another feels about it. Don't let that bother you. Decided on principle, not on politics, decided on principle. We've got some very serious things at stake here. And that's why it was so grand the other night there in Hollywood Bowl. Here's Senator Dodd, a Democrat, and here is Walter Judd, a Republican, and the rest of us who are just students of the subject trying to help out. All of us combined. We had Catholics, we had Protestants, we had Jewish people. We didn't have any atheists, and we had a Mormon. So we were kind of across the board. In fact, when uh, one of the speakers got up to announce the religions that were present, uh, he got to Protestant, and then he was going to say Mormon, and then it suddenly dawned on him that even though I'm from Utah, I might not be a Mormon. 
So he, he sputtered a little bit, and then he, he went on and passed over. So he comes rushing off the stage, and he says, Are you a Mormon? And I said, Yes. Oh, he says, What a relief. He said, I almost said you were a Mormon, and then I thought maybe you were a Catholic and you'd be insulted. He said, I didn't know what. I said, No, it's perfectly all right. Well, he says, Next time we'll mention that the Mormons are here too. Well, it's important to appreciate, you see, what's going on in the country because... The United States, with 6% of the Earth's population, is producing one-half of the Earth's developed wealth every year. One-half. One, one and we're consuming a half of the Earth's developed wealth. And we did that because we kept things open. Uh, we didn't allow uh, ourselves to get where uh, we would have been if we had socialized electricity. Let me use this as an example. Because when Edison invented or captured electricity, he lighted Paris, and he lighted several American cities, and he was the genius. Oh, people looked at these lovely lights. You don't have to have these uh, lamps anymore that we used to have in Mexico. In my generation, I've lived where we had to have lamps, and I'll tell you, electric power was wonderful, and we only had it four hours a day down in Mexico. And boy, we appreciated when the lights came on, and you could iron with electricity instead of a flat and so forth. It was a great blessing, and you could have your radio on and everything. Marvelous. Well... Edison was appreciated and admired. And a little fellow came over from Europe and said, Mr. Edison, he got a job with Mr. Edison, in fact. After Mr. Edison liked him and thought he was a nice boy, he said, Mr. Edison, I don't know whether you knew it or not, but you're not making electricity right. Mr. Edison said, what do you mean I'm not making it right? He says, you're making it the most expensive way, Mr. Edison. I'm sorry, but it is not a good way to make electricity. Well, Mr. Edison said, how would you make it? This little fellow whose name was Tesla said, I have a theory that you could do it a lot better and a lot cheaper if you had alternating current instead of direct current. Alternating. Oh, no, Mr. Edison said, that's ridiculous. No, that's ridiculous. Uh, you have never built an alternating current plant, have you? And he says, no, but I would like to, the opportunity, I think it will work. Mr. Edison says, I know it won't work. I've got all this machinery and it's producing direct current electricity and it's the best and the cheapest way. I'm not going to have you wasting the time of the company and our resources working out this silly theory. So do you know what Tesla did? He said, I'm sorry, Mr. Edison, I must resign. You know, and then he went out to Colorado. And in an old barn, he built the first alternating current plant in the world and practically put Mr. Edison out of business. And Thomas A. Edison came and said, Mr. Tesla... <laughs> um, how, how much will these patents cost anyway? And so you, you, what that is? Alternating current. That's not Mr. Edison's electricity. That's Mr. Tesla's electricity. Now what if Thomas A. Edison had been in charge of the socializa socialization of the American electrical system? You see what would have happened? Now our people have just got to get through their minds that this massive centralized monolithic control is bad except in a very few cases, such as the post office, the roads, and some, some even wonder if it wouldn't have been better if they'd have been left uh, to open competition. But be that as it may, we have allowed them to take over uh, the transcontinental highways and the postal services, but we found that where they control the railroads, the railroads go broke, as they've now done. They're all in a state of bankruptcy. Uh, when they over-control any other industry, they tend to go broke. Now, you should know that. The, and so the communists are back there saying to the socialists, keep going, keep going. You'll take over the country ahead of time, and it'll be very easy once you've set them all up in big bureaus for us to root in and knock the leaders out of the way, just like we did in Czechoslovakia, just like we've done in other countries. And the people will be under communism and hardly ever know it. Now, I hear some people with Ph.D. degrees saying the way to stop communism is to go socialism. And this leaves me almost speechless. I don't know whether to take them by the hand and go back to kindergarten with them. I don't know whether they've gone to progressive schools or what, but they've missed almost every basic aspect of economics, political science, and history that I was taught. So I don't know where to start with them to, to, to retrain them for the most elementary facts of life. And they get very angry at me. Uh, yesterday, the uh, student paper up at the University of Utah came out and said I was an isolationist. Well, that must be bad. And it was interesting because, you see, nothing that I said, and you heard me, was anything to do with isolation. 
It's the Russians that want to isolate us. What I want to do is keep us from being isolated. And how do you do that? You isolate the Russians. That's all I ever talked about was isolating the Sino-Soviet bloc. Now, if somebody wants the communists to take over the world and we cut ourselves off from the communists and don't go under, well, then sure, we would be isolated. But everything I advocated was to isolate the enemy, not the United States, to solidify us and our allies. That's all I talked about. But here it was. Mr. Skousen is an isolationist for these reasons. Complete distortion, misrepresentation, and... Um, and you could see that the editorial, and it's only one person speaking, but it was an editorial. It was designed to count me an enemy of progress and truth and so forth. And all I ask them to do is be honest. If I am an isolationist, I'll admit it, but I don't happen to be. I'm in favor of combining England and France and Canada. I feel like the, Joseph, like the prophet Joseph Smith had it when he says, come one, come all. You love freedom, join with us. And we will put down these predatory monolithic forces in the earth that spread nothing but the whirlwind of war and fire and slaughter. So mine is one of unification and strengthening, not one of weakening or of isolating. But anyway, some people seem to, to want to constantly create that image that those of us that are trying to get some action are for some reason or another real odd, strange people. So I'm so appreciative of your being here tonight and hearing us out, so that if somebody says that to you, you can say, no, these people don't believe that. Have you read their books? Have you, do you know what they, have you listened to their talks? Now we've got to gradually strengthen our thinking and, and go forward and, and say we want to solve all our problems, but we don't want to do it with socialism, we don't want to do it with communism. We want to do it however it can be done in an arena of freedom, an open society. We don't want a situation where Tesla could, uh, would, would not be able to build a plant better than the established plants. We want to be able to compete. And now let me just say one other word here on this part of my talk because it's most important that our people understand this. Our people haven't studied economics. I didn't get it in school. The, the basic uh, marvelous things that makes America work were never taught to me in school. I didn't go in this state, by the way. I went in California. But I wasn't taught uh, what makes America click. Do you know under the American system, if you get two people who are honest and they make a bargain, both people make a profit. Now, in your pocket, you have a little credit. You want to buy a used car, let's say. In your pocket, you have either some credit or some money. So you go down to a used car lot, and you pick out a model that you like. You're in a position where you think you can easily pay $1,400. But you've picked out one that costs $1,800. It's not quite worth $1,800 to you. It's worth a little more than $1,400. You'll have to stretch yourself a little, but... 1400 you could handle nicely, 1800 you, you don't feel like you can handle at all. I mean, that's the wife's um, new bedroom set and uh, two or three other little things that we're going to buy there. So anyway, you can't put it all in the car. And maybe you've got a boy on a mission and two or three other things. So you say, 1400 is absolutely the most credit I could comfortably spend. And maybe I could go a little bit more by stretching, but 1800 no. No, I'll keep my credit. I have to go without the car. If I have to pay 1800 I've either got to get a different car. That one I cannot handle. So the salesman says to, to you, um, uh, you interested in this car? And you say, yes, but not at that price. Now, the man who is selling the car paid $1,400 for it. So he's trying to make $400 profit, which would be a nice little margin. It isn't exorbitant, but it's nice. It isn't nearly as much as some things are marked up. A lot of things are marked up 100%. But he's going to make a nice little profit. 400 would be pretty good, and he can buy his wife some furniture. So uh, you are a customer, and so you talk back and forth, and, and uh, he says, well, uh, that's a pretty good price at 1800 And you say, well, frankly, it isn't worth that much to me. So you start to walk away. Well, now he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, the car is no good to me, just sitting here on the lot. Uh, I need the money. I've got to buy some other cars. Uh, what could you pay? So the man says, well, I got 1400 Well, he says, that's what I paid for the car. He said, I've got to make a little out of it. So he says, I'll tell you what, I'll give it to you for $1,700. And the, man says, uh, the other man says, no, but I, I would go $1,500. Finally, the salesman says, well, look, let's get together. We'll go right in the middle. Uh, let's, let's say 
So the man with the 1,400 comfortable credits says, well, let me see. I, I, yeah, if I took a little extra job on this side, I guess I could handle 1,600. So he drives the car away. Now notice what happened. Is the man who sold the car better off than he was before the car was sold? Yeah, he's $200 better off. Is the man who came with the $1,400 credit better off? Has he improved his position? He says, um, yes, I'd rather have, I'd rather give up the $1,600 or the credit, whatever it represented, and have the car. So as he drives the car off, he's better off. He's improved his position. Now, if he'd had to pay $1,800, he wouldn't be. He would, have, he would feel like uh, he was taken. But at $1,600, he's better off now than he was. Now, you see how we both win? This is how Americanism free enterprise works. And some of our people, the, they, they think what we, what we have in our system is just terrible, just awful. And I recommend to them that they go on a mission to Brazil, where my boy now is, or that they go over to Europe somewhere, where I have another boy on a mission. My boy in Brazil says in his letters, Dad, I can sing God bless America like I never sang it before in my life. And I'll tell you, we've got a tremendous thing here. In fact, I took all my children to Mexico for their vacation two years ago. And... Uh, even down to my little five-year-old. Oh, he appreciated America after he came across that line. Well, Mexico's coming up gradually, but I'll tell you it's a primitive society to compare to this one. I got a long ways to go. Now, keeping in mind that we've got this tremendous thing going, let me just say very briefly what's happening in the world. Along comes the United Nations supervised by men who are socialists and men who are communists because they're all mixed in there together. The leadership of the United States has not been either free enterprise or American, either in its, in its charter, its structure, its administration, or its policy. Now, our people have known that, but they have known what they could do about it. And so we had this terrible tragedy happen in the Congo, where we supported the United Nations in going down to that little country that was trying to get its freedom, and we paid over... Fifty million dollars to pay for these mercenaries. And that's what they were. They were mercenaries. They were outsiders who went in and used the barrel of a gun to try to force those people to accept a communist coalition government. That's what the UN was forcing on the Congo, a communist coalition government. And one man held out. His name was Sham Bay down in Katanga, the richest province. And so we paid the troops that went in there and shot his followers out from under him so that he was replaced. And you know what he was replaced by? He was replaced by Gazenga's right-hand man, and Gazenga is the communist strongman of the Congo. So what happened over in Moscow? Moscow came out on the 13th, or was it the 8th of September, in the New Moscow Times, and said, we've won the Congo. And Americans shook their heads and said, what happened? We were supporting the UN, the UN won, and Moscow says, touchdown. So it's just like a football game. Here we get in there and put in $50 million and we tell the UN, get in there and we, we get the, the line all lined up and the lines hit and we stack up and we say, boy, we really stopped that team and we get back up off of, uh, out of the heap and catch our breath and all of a sudden we hear the crowd cheering as a touchdown has been made. Touchdown, what happened here? We stopped these guys. What happened? What do you mean a touchdown? You know what happened? We, didn't, we stopped watching the ball carrier. That's what happened. Now, that's what happened in the Congo. The Congo just about went communist. So you know what happened? My good friend, Senator Thomas Dodd, former FBI agent, rose up in the Senate of the United States in four magnificent speeches during September and said, Mr. President, Ambassador Stevenson, Dean Rusk, what in the world are you supporting in the Congo? You are wrong, wrong, wrong. And we've got to go back. If you're not careful, you're going to have that whole country going communist. And so what's happened? Dag Hammarskjöld flew down after he'd taken over Katanga, and the natives were fighting, resisting so bitterly that Shambe said, I'll fight right up to my own doorstep, and if they take my house, they'll find me in it dead. It was give me liberty or give me death, and the Katangalese down there did the same thing. They said to the United Nations, you'll have to kill every one of us to take this province. And so that was when 
Dag Hammarskjöld, a Marxist socialist, always has been. He denies being a communist, but he's always been a Marxist socialist, who was fighting for a communist coalition takeover in the Congo, flew down to order a ceasefire. His altimeter was wrong. He crashed and was killed. And after Shambay had put a wreath on his casket, the press asked him how they how he felt about it, and he said, well, I'm always sorry when a man suffers a tragedy. I feel for his family, but I have to say to you, there lies the body of the man that ordered the massacre of our people who wanted nothing in the world but their independence and freedom that he was taking away from them. And this is absolutely true. So a few senators shook their head and listened to Senator Dodd and said, can you be right? He said, of course I'm right. What are you people doing? Concentrating on Berlin where the panic button was pushed and the touchdowns made at Congo and in Laos where we just got another communist coalition government. We've lost Laos. We're going to lose all Southeast Asia. We're going to lose all of Africa the way we're going. And who was back of this? The United States State Department. The same ones that were back of the takeover that re resulted in the loss of China. The very same group that got us to back Castro. You see, Castro is in charge of Cuba for one reason. The United States State Department put him there. And when Congress asked about it, the State Department said, he's not a communist, we guarantee it. Back Castro and we'll have a free Cuba. And our own ambassadors to Cuba were telling the State Department that he was a communist. That's what happened. So you remember the other night on the broadcast, I said, oh, the first thing I recommend to you is that we have a full-scale congressional investigation of the United States State Department. And uh, I didn't know how the audience would react. It was kind of thrilling the way they did. The people of the United States know that there's a fraud being perpetrated. And do you know who those men are in the State Department? They belong to a little group of socialists, Fabian so socialists. They sometimes call themselves Keynesian socialists, but it's the same thing. They're out to get rid of the Constitution and to get a one-world government with the United States merely a province. They make no bones about it, and they are absolutely above the people. You should talk with them sometime. As Senator Dodd said, I asked him for a decent civil answer, and he said, you'd think that I was nobody. And they say that they're running things, and, uh, and they really have run things right into the ground. And so after I came off the stage, he said, that State Department investigation especially, let's go for that. So you need to start talking. Your representative, which is Representative King, needs to hear from you, and your senator needs to hear from you. You've got two of them. You can write to both of them. They need to, you need to let it be heard. Now, these two senators are both under the impression that the, com com the Communist Party cannot be outlawed, so they both need an education. Someone called me on the phone today and said they contacted these senators, and both of our senators have said Mr. Skousen's suggestion the Communist Party be outlawed um, is uh, impossible, unconstitutional. You cannot outlaw a political party. This is the communist line. And these men aren't communists. You can always outlaw a criminal. So we've got to educate our own leaders. And the re research in the, in the constitutional aspects of this were done by the state of Arizona before they ever outlawed the Communist Party down there. So what's the Supreme Court done? First of all, on June the 6th, it declared that it was a crime to be a member of the Communist Party. Did you know that? The Supreme Court's now upheld it. It's a crime to be a member of the Communist Party. Here last week, they declared that, the, furthermore, the Communist Party is a foreign alien agency that has to register now. Did you catch that? And here are our senators saying that you can't outlaw an agency that's a foreign agency whose members are criminals that's already been upheld by the Supreme Court. Now, will you start talking and get that message to your representatives? One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. And if, if these reports I'm getting are correct, they're both wrong. And I'm sure they're both sincere, but they've got to be educated. So will you help us do that? Some letters from you will be very very helpful. And if they write back to you and say, this is impossible, why then you suggest that they make contact with someone who studied it and checked it out. That you hear it isn't impossible, and that it ought to be done, and the quicker it's done, the better. And so that was the second thing that I mentioned the other night. And then I mentioned that we ought to outlaw the Communist Party internationally. 
Now, we had it outlawed at one time. We had it outlawed up until 1933. We had the communist leaders uh, boxed right in inside of the Soviet Union. They couldn't get out. They wanted to get out because their own people were about to explode. As a matter of fact, in December of 1932, they almost pulled Stalin down and executed him. And it was Molotov that came to his rescue and says, well, let's not disturb things here for a few months, see if it doesn't get better, and then if it doesn't, then we will demote Mr. Stalin. And Stalin knew that they would immediately kill him. So you know what they did in those next few months? First of all, Hitler rose up in power, and they used that to scare themselves. And they said, oh, oh here's Hitler with a strong anti-Soviet platform. And the next thing they did, they got the United States to recognize the Stalin regime. And that legalized them. That immediately allowed them to start moving out across the world. And that opened up the floodgates of conquest until they now have a quarter of a billion, or a billion human beings under their domination. That's what did it. So what have they been doing while we've recognized them? We gave them $11 billion worth of lend lease to save them from Hitler. We have bent over backwards. We've, ele we've let them abuse us. We've let them violate every treaty that they've made with us. There are 53. They've violated every one except the two that were self-serving. 51 out of 53 they've violated. And we take it lying down as we would not from any other country. What kind of, what kind of management is this of our affairs? So that was my next suggestion, that we outlaw communism internationally. And we say to our allies, let's tell them we've had enough. We tried to help them learn how to become good neighbors. It isn't in them. It's like telling a gangster, uh, you don't have to stay over in that block. We're going to show you how nice we can be to you. You can come over and have dinner with us, you see. You can circulate around town. And the next thing we know, he's taken over the whole town. So we say, uh-oh, this is no good. Back to jail for you. And so that's what we recommended, that we cut off diplomatic relations with Russia. Now, this is what the University of Utah paper called me an isolationist for, for trying to isolate Russia. Don't they want Russia to be isolated? The next thing I recommended is that we reorganize the United Nations. The United Nations was a fraud from the beginning, but our people didn't read the charter, so they didn't know it. And John Foster Dulles, who went along with it originally, didn't know that it was being written and prepared by a man who was working for the Soviet Union, named, namely uh, Alger Hiss. Did you, had that come to your attention? Alger Hiss was the one that was responsible for preparing the, the um, United Nations Charter, and it later came out he's working for Russia all the time. So what did we get? We got a Russian institution. We've got a General Assembly in the United Nations where the countries are represented, and they don't have one iota of legislative authority to deal with war. It's fantastic. Well, who does have the power to deal with war? The power block in the Security Council, the big countries. And they're the ones that are able to say to the other countries, you will have peace and we'll dictate to you the terms. This is the way you're going to get peace. That's the way the UN Charter is written. And you know there isn't one single iota of machinery in the UN Charter to prevent one of the big five in the Security Council from starting World War III. And it's one of the big five, namely Russia, that's out to take over the world and start World War III. So the UN is of no protection to you as it's presently constituted. It could be made of protection to you. And that's why some of us have rewritten the UN Charter. We're almost through. We're going to publish thousands of copies of it. So when people get sufficiently upset with Russia, they can say, all right, let's get together and remake these United Nations. And by the way, there will, the Article 4 of the present charter says no nation may be a member unless it's a peace-loving nation. Isn't that ridiculous? And here Russia's been there all the time. So we're going to say we believe that fourth article. And no war-making nation is going to be in the new United Nations. And Russia won't be there, and neither will any of her satellites. And some people say, oh, this is bad. Then she won't be represented, will she? And she'll probably go over and form a block all of her own. Well, she's already done it. She's holding her conference right now. Her United Nations are meeting in Moscow tonight. What have we done? We've allowed her to be represented in our United Nations where she completely sabotages and bedevils us and keeps us from getting together. So all I asked our audience the other night, as you noticed, was that we now rally our people together. 
that we isolate the enemy, that we combine our strength in the West, and that we say to the communists, we're going to smother you and let your people come forth free. That ought to be our policy. Total victory without a war. What does it take? A little courage and a little common sense. Nothing brilliant, just common sense. That's what's so frustrating about this. When you read The Naked Communist, if you have, as most people, they'll come up to me and say, Cleon, it's so ridiculous what's happened. I can even figure out a better way than the way they did it. And I'm not even trained in this area. This is true. The man on the street at this moment is calling the shots better than the Secretary of State. And you say to yourself, well, how can this be? Well, I'll tell you why it is. The Secretary of State isn't listening to you. He isn't listening to Senator Dodd. And he isn't listening to others. He's listening to this little socialistic clique that have always been his pals, that are out to build one world government, and are out to socialize the United States and make it a province of the world. That's his policy. And the president is caught in a position where everything they've told him to do so far has been a catastrophe. And so he's, he's now called in my good friend, uh, General Maxwell Rich, who serves on the Strategy Commission of the American Security Council, of which I've been serving as the field director. And I've been so busy, I'm now asking to be made just a consultant. But General Maxwell Rich is, uh, excuse me, Maxwell Taylor. Did I say Rich? Maxwell Taylor. We've got a lot of Maxwells here. Uh, Maxwell Rich is a good man, too. But Maxwell Taylor is the one that's going to be next to the president and has been for some time since the fiasco in Cuba. And he's the one that's now at Vietnam to tell the president what he thinks we should do. Now, if the president will listen to him, I think this man is capable of coming up with some good answers, and I hope the president responds. We want our leaders to be winners. We're not against our leaders, but when they're wrong, don't sit silently by. You don't do them a favor when you do that. We must not sit silently by. And last of all, and I don't want to tire you, but this is my final point. How could you let the Iron Curtain cave in on the communist leaders and destroy them so that their people could come out free men? It's very simple. Just stop feeding, fondling, and coddling them. Do you know the letters behind the Iron Curtain say these very words? I got a letter some time ago which said, Mr. Skousen, there must be a noose of ignorance around the necks of the West. Don't they know we'd overthrow our slave masters ourselves if the West would just stop feeding, fondling, and coddling them? Well, what's going on? Well, 39 nations are feeding the Sino-Soviet bloc and keeping it alive. Notice what happens behind the Iron Curtain. Communism can't keep its people alive. If you leave communism in force, famine will immediately take over as it has in China. And rationing will take over as it has in every satellite country in Russia. So when they collapse, what have we been doing? We've been sending, the, the Western allies have been sending millions of bushels of wheat. And so here's a little fellow, we'll call him Michael. And he's behind the Iron Curtain, he's got a little family. And it's terrible, he's living like an animal almost, but he is at least living and we get not a lot of food and my children are poor, and, but we're getting by, maybe it will improve. Now here's a man named Joseph, who is a freedom fighter. He says to Michael, let's overthrow them. And Michael says, well, I hate to do that. We might get killed, and then there are my children. They will not have a father. I don't think we should take the chance. At least we're getting by. And then the word comes, no more help from the West. Now Joseph goes to Michael and says, do you love your children? If we have to live with communism and we get no help from the West, you'll see them starve and die around you, Michael. Are you ready to move? And Michael says, if the West has cut us off, it is time to move. We must overthrow our slave masters. Now that's what the freedom fighters have been telling us. Now some people say, well, Joseph or Michael isn't going to rise up. He's got a pistol in his head. He wouldn't dare rise up. But the people who say that miss the whole Hungarian Revolution. And last Monday night, I had only 29 minutes to cover my subject. And I covered it in 29 minutes. But the part that I hated to leave out most of all was this part about the Hungarian Revolution, which would take two minutes, but I'd, 
Well, the clock ran out on me, but I did want to explain to the people how easy it is to have the Iron Curtain countries come forth free men. Now, the Hungarian Revolution is the key, and we must get this going. I'll be speaking to the freedom fighters of Hungary next Monday night, and I'm going to tell them to hang on and keep telling their story because we're going to use it for the new ignition that will turn those people loose one of these days in Europe. Notice what the Hungarians did. They got to reading the UN Charter, the Warsaw Pact and the Yalta Agreement, in which Russia had agreed that any one of the satellites could become free any time they wanted to assert their freedom. Isn't that interesting? So the Hungarians, especially students, massed together in the squares of Budapest and raised their signs up in their voices and said, we are free, Mr. Khrushchev. We assert our freedom and demand self-determination. The Soviet occupation officials fired on these students when they wouldn't disperse. And the revolution began. They pulled down Stalin's statue and they put the Hungarian freedom flag in the, on the stump. And so the Soviet occupation officials said to the Hungarian communist troops that the Soviet had trained and equipped fire on these mobs and disperse them. But you know what happened? The Hungarian communist troops defected almost to a man and joined the freedom fighters and turned their guns on the Soviet occupation troops. And then you know what happened? The Soviet occupation troops says, don't shoot, we join you. And so the vast majority of the Soviet occupation troops came over and joined the Hungarian freedom fighters. They turned their guns on the remaining Soviet occupation troops and beat them in four days. And the Hungarians said, we are free. And they were. They were free. They had absolutely smashed their communist occupation government. And who smashed it? First the people resisted, and then the communists with communist guns in communist uniforms who hate the communist leaders did the rest. So over there where they say they're communists, they hate communism. Are they communists? As one of the generals afterwards said, sure, I was a communist. We were all communists. We hated it. But that's the only way you could hold a job. That's the only way you could stay in the army. That's the only way you could earn a living for your family. Sure, we were communists, and we hated it. So on the first chance we got, we overthrew them. And then you know what happened? Khrushchev brought in a quarter of a million troops with 5,000 tanks, came to the borders of Hungary, waited to see what America would do. We were cowards. We didn't even order NATO to march to the borders and tell Russia to stay out or we'd go in too. We didn't even protest. NATO didn't protest. UN didn't protest. Nobody protested. And as a result, they marched into Hungary and butchered 100,000 men, women, and children whose blood is on the skirts of the West this night. And I'm sure God in heaven is, is going to hold the leaders of the Western nations accountable for those human beings that suffered death. There was no honor in it. There was no valor in it. There was no manhood in it. It was cowardice. And so Russia was allowed to get away with a violation of Article 2 of the UN Charter, with her agreements in the Yalta Agreement, with her own Warsaw Pact Agreement. She was never challenged. That's the, the world that you and I have lived through these last few years. That was 1956. Where were you in 56? Our children are going to ask us, Dad, where were you? What were you doing? What did you say? Did you mention it to anybody? And most mothers and dads will have to say, gosh, I was so busy. Let me see, what was it? When did that happen? October? We're getting ready for Halloween, I think, or something. <laughs> so now it's time for us to redeem our past and to be the men and women we ought to be. And I was so proud of Elder Ezra Taft Benson in this last conference when he took the, the main theme that President McKay had announced and elaborated upon it and says, don't be confused. Communism and socialism are twin sisters. They'll both destroy the Constitution. Avoid both of them like a plague. Don't let those names confuse you. And listen to the prophets of God, one in particular who said in the eighth chapter of Ether, 
that the day would come in the latter days when the Gentiles would be plagued by a great secret combination. And it would be a secret combination that would try to take over every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And Moroni says, And God commandeth you that you shall repent and rise up and put this combination down before it gets above you. Some of our people want the other two-thirds of the Book of Mormon. We're not even listening to the one-third that we've got. They want the other two-thirds of the plates to be translated. We'll get them. But the Lord wants us to at least listen to the words that he put there hundreds and hundreds of years ago as he showed the prophets the vision of this wonderful nation and the crises that it would face and gave us instruction as to what we should do. Up to now we have disobeyed the commandments of the Lord and have done a very poor job. And it's time to repent. And it's time to study. And it's time to get our children around us and our neighbors around us and to have little study groups and to read the paper with our eyes open and not let ourselves be misled anymore because we can win. God says we can win. And with God's help, we shall win. And I pray we'll be worthy of his help, that we'll listen to our leaders, that we'll not be confused in this hour. And if somebody comes along to you when you stand up for the Constitution of the United States and calls you fascist or an extremist or a butcher and all these other uh, names, or an isolationist, pay no attention. Plow around them. There are millions of good men and women out there that are not that confused. They'll listen to you. Don't even waste too much time arguing with these other people. Time will demonstrate to them who was right. Meanwhile, let's get the message to the people whose hearts are tuned in with the prophets of God, who know that we're in a time of crisis, and let us move forward with vigor like the descendants of the prophets should do. And this I pray we will accomplish. And I ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure that we have many thoughts on our mind tonight. As Brother Skousen was giving his remarks uh, relative to being branded an isolationist, one thought came to my mind, and if I know he has covered his subject good, but if you'll bear with me, I'm going to ask him a question, and I hope to ask it so he will not be put on a spot in his own hometown. As we recall, I'm sure all of us have saw the picture Operation Abolition on television, and it was charged that in this that the communists had inspired or got in with the editors of the student newspapers and uh, got their word across to riot and to cause a, a turmoil that was caused. And now Brother Skousen tells us that he was branded uh, isolationist by the University of Utah paper. I'm not going to ask the question in the sense that he can put himself on a spot with a university, but could you tell us, Brother Skousen, to your knowledge, is this communist influence uh, being exacted throughout the college newspapers throughout the country? You don't have to answer that. Put yourself on a spot with one university of Utah. <laughs> well, these influences actually are subtle and they come up from many sources. First of all, I'm glad you mentioned the Operation Abolition because this is what got me on TV and debate in, in Utah here just this last summer. I found that the university students were being given the communist line. And I'm, I'm not accusing the people who were giving the line of being communist, but they were PLPs, which is a party line paralleler. So I wanted to get them straightened out, and I offered to do it, and they just continued telling our students what was not true. And that's when I made it kind of an issue out of it because uh, uh, we have a love for these boys and girls. I don't like to see them deceived, and they were being deceived. So I challenged the professor to a public debate, and he refused to debate me. And then I was able to discover that where he was getting his information, I found that he was one of the national officers of the Emergency Civil Liberties Committee, which has been cited both by the House and the Senate committees as being a communist front organization. And here's the acting head of one of our departments at the university, a national officer in this organization. And I thought our people ought to know. The Board of Regents has done nothing about it, but that's their business. Uh, all I can do is to point out what the problem was and the fact that their students 
We're not enjoying academic freedom. You see, academic freedom includes the right to know the truth. You have a right to hear the truth. You have a right to hear every other side, too, but you, a student has the right to hear the truth. That's academic freedom. And that was being denied them. And they were coming down off the hill denouncing Operation Abolition. And that was an exciting film because it allowed parents for the first time to see these uh, blatant, noisy, insulting, and insufferable communist leaders in San Francisco defying a congressional committee, insulting them, preventing testimony from being taken, and then agitating the students into a riot. So the Communist Party has as its number one project to do away with the House Committee of Un-American Affairs, the House Un-American Activities Committee, it's called, which exposes communism. That's its main purpose. Now, that's the number one communist project. And here I find professors belonging to organizations that are cited as communist fronts and are also trying to do away with the House Committee on American Activities. Now, you pay their wages. I pay their wages. I'm entitled to challenge them. And they say that when I do, then that I'm, uh, in fact, the word fascist was used. That's interesting. As I told one of the professors who uh, later debated me, uh, the way he talked, he must have thought that I had my troops up at the Soldier Summit or something, all <laughs> ready to take over. And, and, and uh, our real position is, let's just restore old-fashioned Americanism. Well, now you'll find these influences, and I've given you this background, so you'll see how it kind of seeps up in, in lots of areas. Uh, supposing the student that wrote this particular editorial had just listened to that professor. I know that professor will call me more names than just an isolationist. And the student may be absolutely sincere in what he's doing because he may not have been exposed to academic freedom, which is the truth. So in answer to your question, this is just something for you to watch because it's going on and some of the parents are beginning to say, there's nothing sacred about a professor. And if he is rendering a service, it's the service of dispensing truth. And he's just as open to challenge when he dispenses what we think is falsehood as anybody else. So this, this once again, is your business. And we're not mentioning the professor's name, brothers and sisters, but people have big ideas in store for him. Is that not correct? <laughs> I'm sure we're all grateful, brothers and sisters, and edified, and I hope shocked, and I hope determined, and I could add many adjectives to cause us to go forth from this meeting tonight with a renewed determination to see this thing through in the only way that it can be seen through. It's a little appalling as we notice the people around us, people bringing up children in homes without the benefit of a newspaper, and newspapers coming in homes and only the funny papers being marred by reading. These conditions that are upon us are our own doing. But I think, brothers and sisters, we have the gospel we must live it to the T. We must judge our lives accordingly. I pray that our Heavenly Father will bless us that we may be able to see fit to do this and to go forth and carry out our obligations not only to our church but to our country and above all to ourselves and our families. Thank you, Brother Skousen, for filling us in on a very busy schedule. We're highly appreciative of it. I believe you see by the attendance here tonight, perhaps, that your crusade or your dedication is starting from scratch, and I hope that it will grow. I hope that we can hold a meeting like this in the near future, that we can not only fill the hall out and back, but the amusement hall, and I hope that that would have been the case tonight. We do not apologize for the people for having gone deer hunting as much as we apologize for them, for their complacency. Brother Hall, would you come forth and offer, offer a closing prayer for us? Brother Thomas Hall. I have on the schedule to sing uh, America the Beautiful before Brother Hall closes with prayer. What page is that on? 126.
Our Father which art in heaven, we thank thee for the truth that we have heard this night. We know that only truth will make us free. We ask thy blessings upon Brother Skousen, an elder that is stepping forth to save our nation. Now may we all sense this prophecy and as elders do our part to save our country. It is on us at the present time that the country must be saved and we must step forth to save it. Give us faith in ourselves, give us faith in prophecy. May we realize the value of our own efforts and that freedom must have the efforts of all those that love truth and love freedom. We ask thy special blessings upon Brother Skousen that his body will hold up and give him strength to hold up under this strenuous work that he is under and that the Holy Ghost may accompany him to enlighten him to detect all that is not truth and to find a way to encourage us in putting this down. Now give us faith, give us power and determination to do our part. We ask this in the worthy name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for that lovely prayer.